really? The Facebooking and the tweeting and the Instagramming, all that would not exist without our understanding of science. So it's amazing that you took that as an insult. If you mean true for you is different from true for anybody else, have yeah, something to absolutely, absolutely, because I can't think either got to be true or not. I can't, no, no. Good evening, citizens of Netlandia. Welcome to O'Reilly Radio 108 for Friday, May 6th, 2016, where we dismantle the current events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations that'll make you go, oh, really. I'm your host, Andy Cowan, with my usual suspects. I've got Michael Robinson, Fred Sims, Stephen Griffith, and Daniel Atherton. Welcome, gentlemen. Good evening. Welcome to the Parliament. Yes, yes, I'm I'm taking my place again. Excellent, excellent. And uh, and I hear that since the last time we met, you have gained employment. Yes, I have, and now I've got other options. As always happens, once you finally gain employment, 15 other opportunities open in front of you, and I'm preparing to pursue them all. All, all the irons that were in the fire start to leap out at you. That's usually yes, what happens. Yes, sometimes, sometimes violently. I've had to dodge. Uh-oh. Well, hopefully you dodge in the right direction, and everything comes out smelling like roses. Uh, we did had no no audience feedback from last week's show, so either we did really well or no one listened, uh, or at least nobody said anything. Uh, so, but you know we're human; we make mistakes. So please, if you find one, go ahead and let us know about it. Uh, email them into us at really radio podcast at gmail dot com, or phone it in at four seven zero two 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 six seven five nine. Or you can also text us. We get all that. If you leave a voicemail, we're likely to play it because I like that. You know, come on, come on feedback we need to know we need to know what's wrong tell us tell us tell us of course you could also tweet us you know at at o'reilly radio um and also there's the facebook page you can hail us over there send us a message and uh we will get it and we'll let you know what's going on okay so uh ranty segments um so ted cruz decided after indiana after he lost again to the trump to drop out uh, that basically made him the de facto, made Trump the de facto nominee for the GOP. And uh, then all of a sudden, Kasich dropped out too. And then so. people had to remember that Kasich still hadn't dropped out yet, and they were like, oh, crap. Well, so. you know, he was that guy in, in the back of your head that you really hoped he had some sort of chance. So let's be entirely accurate with this. Uh. No single Republican candidate, as far as I'm aware, has actually dropped out and the suddenly fr- the frightening thing is when it comes to this the semantics are important yes suspended all has suspended. happened okay so so suspended versus dropped out are semantically different uh, yes, or also totally rules different. different they're they're practically ha- different okay what happens is this if you suspend a campaign every vote that has been cast for you every delegate that you have had before that you still have. They are still yours. They do not get reassigned or anything else. They're yours. If you drop out, then those delegates that you gain get reassigned to the people who are still in it. What is happening is this is a standard and very common tactic where they will maintain what they've got until the convention comes around and then do some horse trading because, hey, I've got these delegates. I can let them go and let them all toward, go toward you or help you if you a little quid pro, quid pro quo. Huh. So the Kasich Cruz block could happen. Could, yes. Huh. Where Kasich trades his his delegates to Cruz for some favor insert thing here. Yeah, it's political horse trading. And then those delegates, if there can be more horse trades made from other people who have suspended their campaigns, move to block Trump and have a contested convention. Or an I say move to block Trump to have a contested convention. It could, if it does contest it, if he doesn't get the number of votes necessary, then, yeah, they could move to say, hey, go for this guy and completely shut Trump out and get whoever else they want in there. Or it could be, okay, hey, Trump, we'll give you the nomination, but we're going to expect a little bit of uh, something to come back to us for that, you know, possibly, you know, consideration, not actual, but consideration of cabinet positions, uh, things like that. Maybe, hey, yeah. throw some things, you know, say some good things about my state, or you owe me a favor later. Well, Trump uh, went on the record uh, 
saying that he would consider Kasich as a VP, and then later on he would consider Cruz as a VP. I believe he's considering neither of them as VP. Um, well, no, he said they were. He was considering them. They were on the list for him. Both of them have said hell no. Oh, did they? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Actually, a huge number of people said hell no. Well, uh, yeah. Fortunately, Governor Voldemort also said no that he likes his job. <laughs> you know, you know who didn't say hell no? Rick Perry. No, he said, no I like my job. Rick so, Rick Perry said please. Yes, he did. After calling him uh, in July of last year, uh, calling Trump uh, a cancer that should be excised from the party. That's because Rick Perry is looking to, like, you know, have a job and be relevant again in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, pretty much. I'm surprised we haven't heard from uh, good old Bobby Jindal. From well, former governor Bobby Jindal? <laughs> I, that's yeah. why I just say Bobby Jindal. <laughs> I'm not yeah. saying former governor because well, he doesn't yeah, even—he's not even deserving of that. About, the stuff about. Um his state going absolutely into the fucking tank and then as soon as he was out of office it immediately started recovering that didn't do well for his image even among his diehard fans yeah, you know sound yeah. economic policies are an amazing thing yeah, yeah. it's a good thing no the, the 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 thing of note here is who is not being viewed as any sort of vice presidential candidate by the GOP which is brown back Okay, what for for the listeners at home that do not pay attention quite as much as we do, go ahead and, and tell them why that's important. Well, again, uh, Governor Brownback, governor of Kansas, um, has thoroughly put in place GOP economic policies for Kansas. The state is in a downward spiral, and it's coming close to hitting rock bottom. They are hemorrhaging money. They're having to make cuts left and right. Uh, cutting taxes for the top percent has not brought jobs into the state. Uh, has not brought money into the state. And in fact, it's bankrupting the state. Um, yeah, this is the state where, as we've said, said before, they went from under a Democratic governor a $700 million surplus to, as soon as Brownback came in, a $300 million deficit. Yeah. So and it keeps billion dollar this. swing. Uh, it's to the point now where uh, Brownback, in his own state, seems to be alone now. Uh, most of his local GOP no longer have his back on his policies, though he's still he's trying to push through the House and, and, and Senate even more tax cuts. Shocking. While, while cutting public programs. Um, well, yeah, because how else is he going to fund the damn things? So... That he's trying to going this will work and keep pushing as it's being shown again and again and again it's bankrupting his state the terrifying yeah. thing though is while we have this abject lesson a lot of other republican controlled states are going through with his tax plans his economic plans and are trying to push them forward into law in those states yeah, for all of our listeners out there, uh. quick, quick history on economics and lesson on that. You hear all the people always talk about tax cuts, tax cuts, how great it is everything else, but everybody has to remember, the government still has bills to pay, and taxes are where they get their money to pay said bills, so as soon as they cut taxes, where are they got to get the money from? I'll yeah, yeah. think about that for a while. It, they, <laughs> they don't get it from anywhere. I mean, people, uh, in particular when I was living in um, Carolina, this was a huge thing because it's a red state and they want you to cut taxes everywhere. And then they would immediately turn around and bitch about how many potholes were in the roads. And I look at them and say, well, where do you get – where are you going to fund the public works to fix, fix the roads? Yeah, it's like that shit's not free. Well, the, gov the government pays for that. <laughs> yeah, where does the government get its money? You you taxes. are the government. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Remember, guys, as much as we – as much as people try to dissuade you about this, the voting public, the people, the citizens of this country are the government. We, we are them. the government. We vote them into office. We pay them to exist. This this is not someone else taking our money. Or ideally speaking, it shouldn't be someone else taking to our money or to pay for things we don't want or need. Ideally, this is our this is our money, everybody's money, going into things all of us use, like roads and power lines and schools. Yeah, just a little little things like that. You know. Again, 
we need in our new deal. We we need public works because when public works, the public works. I wouldn't yes. mind seeing a, a trillion dollar spending bill that is all about revitalizing the infrastructure of the United States. Because dear lord, do we that. need it? Well, our, yeah. our infrastructure is decaying, but also, I mean, during that era. Think of all the monuments that were built, things that have stood the test of time and have become uh, means of tourism, driving those local economies. If we had something like that again, I, we would shore up our economy. I mean, the, the, there is a reason that Republicans are terrified of a Democratic Socialist, because the last time we had one, he was elected four times, and he built a country that was – went through a period of unparalleled prosperity and growth for 50 plus years with well, a ta with a uh, corporate tax rate of 90 percent yeah yep <laughs> also let's look at eisenhower let's look at i like ike um and, ike was good. and that was the slogan <laughs> I, don't, I don't i didn't like him as much as i liked fdr but he had he had good he had good ideas yeah but I, i'm i'm trying to meet people in the middle here uh i know well, yeah, he was he was much more he was ike was much more moderate yeah yeah i'm trying to meet people in the middle here um, I know most of us are, when it comes to the left-right spectrum, we're, we're, we're more on the left. But I'm trying to meet in the middle. And with, with Ike, I mean, the entire interstate system, that was under his watch. And that also is something that has stood the test of time. It needs to be reinvested in, desperately, mm -hmm. but it's something that gave some, something necessary to our country to improve. So. Let's, let's also not forget you bring up the whole 90% corporate tax rate and people scream, oh my god, I was terrible about that. But remember, under the policies they had there, yeah, if you did nothing with the money and spent yeah. on it, it was taxed yeah. at 90%. Yeah, it's 90%, it's 90, yeah, 90 of profits. Yeah, well, it, it, wasn't even yeah, it was mm -hmm. straight net profit because yeah. if the companies it yeah. encouraged companies and they got a tax break for taking that money and growing their company and paying their workers more and yeah. doing all yes. of that. That money was investing. not taxed. Yeah, it's ninety percent of declared profit at the end of the quarters. You know, it, it's it's untaxed not, it's not growth. 90, it's not ninety percent of the of their gross product. It's not ninety percent of what they make. Yeah. They it the the way that worked was that they have this huge chunk of money that they earned this quarter, and you know, in that period of time before they have to declare it on their tax forms, they say, okay, where can we put this back into the company so we don't have to give it to, to the government? Yeah, it's the same way that and nonprofits work now. That was a now. good thing because it encouraged it encouraged the, the you know the richest of the rich to not give themselves huge bonuses for no reason to invest it back in the infrastructure of their own company, which led to unparalleled economic growth. Well, it grew the individual companies. Let, let, let's. Let's just map out how they reinvested. Um, they would actually grow their companies, so they would go for pay for expansions, um, invest in technology, take that capital and invest it in, in improving the company, as well as that's where you had all those wonderful holiday bonuses and gifts that the company would give its own people. Mm. It was a tax workaround. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could and take think, that money and give it back to your employees, and it wouldn't be taxed. And yeah, because that's that's a that's because that is all bonuses is investment in your um, I forget what the economic term is, but but in to to personal the capital economy, yeah. people are capital. Your yeah. employees are capital. Human a bonus capital. to your employees is investment in that capital, which is tax free. Yeah. Okay, so. We're we're in favor of a new of a new New Deal kind of thing, where we actually oh, yeah. inv invest in America. You know, we're willing that I would certainly be more willing for a big percentage of my taxes to go towards public works than towards bombing another country that is dubious at best. And or, um, if we and if, and if we spiked those, yeah. um, you know, we spike those corporate tax rates again and force them to reinvest in their own businesses, pay their people well, and and all that, I would, I would immediately stop caring about the six-figure salaries of CEOs, and, because and you know, they're taking care of their people. Now they really do deserve all the money they earn. And you know, yeah. what really grows jobs. A business going, hi, we need a new wing. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. New divisions, Absolutely. new technologies. We need. Invest in our own infrastructure, and and just exactly. to just to briefly touch on 
that whole trickle down economics thing, which has basically destroyed the country. Um, voodoo economics. Yeah, three it, times it's done it. Yeah. yeah so but, let's, let's take that country. term voodoo economics and acknowledge where it comes from. That's George H. W. Bush. No, that was actually well, Reagan. Trickle down actual was, advisor. Yeah, trickle was, trickle down Reagan came from the advisor. Reaganomics but in running deal. against Reagan. Oh yeah, he used the term. H. Yeah. W. Pushed that term to the forefront of voodoo economics for the entire trickle down period. True. Hmm. Are you doing trickle down, Andy? Well, with the, with the trickle down, you know, it's basically the the whole theory was if we give it to the upper crust, the um, the job creators, job providers. yeah, the job creators, then they will obviously invest more. That is. So far, been patently false. They don't. They instead, they, don't. they, 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 they instead it, hoard they it. Put it in banks. They put it in offshore tax havens. They mm -hmm. move the money out of the country. Well, what, what happens with the money is it it does not remain liquid, because these, the the robber barons, the capitalists, the you know the the ultra elite, they don't need to spend it. That's the thing. They don't need to spend it. They do not need to put it back into the economy. So and they don't. That, and that's another thing that uh, that I keep trying to explain to supply side economics, mm -hmm. economists, economists. There you go. Because there you they go. don't get it. Money has to be in motion for it to have value. Right. Unless money is moving through the economy, it does nothing. Also, the whole yeah. simple idea of, yeah, you give all the money to this guy who's got a billion dollars. Okay, how many McDonald's hamburgers can that man actually eat? Yeah. I guarantee right. you. You give that same amount of money and spread it across one million people who are below the poverty line, they can eat a lot more than he can. We, yeah. we know that that's how it works because mm -hmm. that's what they did when the New Deal came around. That's and how FDR indoors. saved the country. Yeah. It, if, you want that, if you want the country to prosper, money has to be liquid. So the people that are keeping the economy moving, and that's, and that, that's, that's a buzz phrase too, keep the economy moving. Okay, they've said it, but they don't know. They don't intend the meaning. Exit. <laughs> you know that the people that are living paycheck to paycheck aren't saving. They're not hoarding the money. That money goes immediately back into the economy somewhere. Again, spending is yeah. what what generates your economy. So you want, as you're you're explaining, mm -hmm. you want the money to be spent. Yeah. Um. And if you're looking for the creation of new jobs, there must be demand for product. So There's not going to be demand for product if nobody can buy what you're selling. Right. Which is what Henry Ford figured out when he was doing things. He was going to pay them a wage that was going to allow them to buy the product that they were making. And that is why Ford took off. Yeah. That's why cars exist like they that, do. That, that's, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that's, that's why... Ford was not the only one making cars, but he's the only one we ever hear about because his policy was sound. He's the only well, one who survived. He built yeah. the auto industry because yeah. he's smart enough to go, hi, I'm going to go ahead. Your guys are building the cars. Yeah. You know everything about it. I'm going to go ahead and build consumers got to be. Now, sure, he didn't well, invent the car. He did not no. invent the assembly line. He did not invent the entire process, but he put it all to use better than anyone else at the time. So that's why that's he gets the credit. Also of note, yeah. in his contemporaries... Mm -hmm. He deliberately designed and had made a vehicle for the masses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because beforehand, a car was a luxury item. And right. it had all this handcrafting. It, it, it was moving art. But, but mm -hmm. he got it. He got that the only way that you're going to make a real business out of it is if everybody wants one and everybody buys one. And can buy one. Right. Yeah. The ability to was of paramount importance yeah. now i think that uh since we're since we've now dove down into the history well i think we actually need to talk about other things that have happened this week in history fred oh God, a segue. Brilliant idea. <laughs> i can do a segue now and then yeah we got segues all over the place uh this week in history uh brought to you by christopher columbus who on may 1st 1486 convinced queen isabella to fund an expedition to the West Indies. I think we all know how that one turned out. A lot of natives dying, yeah. Yeah, we bring that mm -hmm. to uh, May 1st, 2011, 
where Osama bin Laden was killed in Abbottabad, Pakistan by United States Navy SEALs in Operation Neptune Spear. Thanks, Columbus. <laughs> see, you, guys, you guys see that leap I made? I, I do. I do see that leap. I think yeah, you just that's, wanted that's to say not a uh, leap. Abbottabad. That's a <sighs> that's awful. You are a bad man. Your ideas are bad and you should feel bad. I, I don't feel bad. I know you don't. <laughs> but my <laughs> ideas are bad, you're correct. <laughs> uh, May 2nd, 1970, uh, student anti-war protesters at Ohio's Kent State University burned down the campus ROTC building in protest. Uh, the National Guard took control of the campus on the 2nd of May. We'll come back to that. Uh, May 3rd, 1952, the first airplane lands at the geographic North Pole. Um, May 4th, uh, in 1626, we get the deal of a lifetime as the American Indians sell Manhattan Island for $24 in cloth and buttons. Um, and then back to Kent State on May 4th, 1970, Ohio National Guardsmen open fire on student protesters at Kent State, killing four and wounding nine others. Uh, just a note about the American Indians selling Manhattan. You know, th they did at least throw in the smallpox on the blankets. But I'm bummed. You know, that was, that was a bonus. Yeah, it, w it didn't state specifically like smallpox cloth or regular <laughs> cloth. It Just cloth and buttons. We want to we wanna hush well, that up a little bit. Let's call it polka dotted. <laughs> Um, and circling all the way back to Christopher Columbus on May 5th, 1494, he lands on the island of Jamaica, which he named Santa Gloria. So that's how that turned out. So close. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, Remember, uh, we're America, not Columbus land. Yeah, not Columbus land. Or Columbia. Land, and uh, we certainly weren't the West Indies. So, that's right, yep. You know, we, we celebrate that day for no reason. Mm-hmm. May yeah, 5th. for America because of Marigo Vespucci. Yep. yep. Yeah. No, Christopher Columbus, let it never be forgotten, was a genocidal, homicidal man. A terrible, terrible man. Yes, he was. And we celebrate that because Murica. <laughs> but I'm assuming yeah. it's, a, it's a translation for Columbus in some language. But, I don't. But gentlemen, the spice must flow. <sighs> the spice. <laughs> yeah, but he didn't even get any spice. I know. <laughs> he he got even... some... It he got gold and Christopher hands. Columbus That's is one of, of is one of history's biggest failures, and he is lauded like he was a success. He got he got it some fruits. He got fruit and he got sugar, which was and a big deal. I mean, I mean, Slaves. we did, we did get rum out of that deal because the sugar eventually got made into rum. That's true. That's right. true. Somebody oh, else would have eventually oh, found no. the sugar with the intention of actually finding that place. Guys, you it struck just out to me. all the way. Guys, it just occurred to what? me. Columbus in 1492 sailed the ocean blue without rum. Maybe that's why that he failed. Upsetting. That is a very no upsetting wonder, thing. No wonder he was such an asshole. When there, he we there we go. There we go. Problems of the world questions. solved. <laughs> Carry on. Speaking of problems of the world, uh, you guys may have remembered, you know, the year 2000, uh, May 5th, 2000, uh, to be precise, the Sun, Earth, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn aligned. Uh, it caused people to freak out. The Earth's moon was also almost in alignment, leading to doomsday predictions of massive natural disasters. Although, I, I remember this day. grand confluence usually happens once every century, so we're, we're pretty adept at avoiding that, you know, natural disaster doomsday prediction thing. Numerology, math, geometry. You know, all those things. <laughs> things that happen all the time. <laughs> and uh, philosophy, as May 5th is a banner day, as uh, both Soren Kierkegaard and Karl Marx were born on May 5th, just five years apart in 1813 and 1818. Um, fast forward to actual today in history. Uh, May 6th, 1856, Sigmund Freud. Uh, I mean, founder, father of psychoanalysis. And... Uh, on May 6th, 1937, the dirigible Hindenburg explodes in flames at Lakehurst, New Jersey. And uh, I believe we have a little bit more on Oh, that. the humanity! The humanity! It still makes me sad because that was literally the end of the dirigible era. I, I would play the video, but you know what? I think, uh, I think we just need to move right along because we, uh, we, talked, we got a lot of traction out of the first segment. So let's... Yeah. <laughs> so let's... Well, let's just carry on. To say, though, if you find the video of that, I mean, give it a watch because the, the announcer, you can, the emotion in his voice is, I mean, you, you can tell. Like, it, it was a, a big, big deal. It's good stuff. I mean, I, I will, um, I will put the link, 
Oh, I just lost the link. I will put the link <laughs> in the show notes so everyone can uh, can go take a look at those out on our webpage at oreallyradio.com. This is for show 108, and this will be in the 108A section, should you be listening and want to find that link. Okay, so, <clears throat> all right, let's see. We have a logical fallacy. The fallacist fallacy. It's also fun to say. The fallacist fallacy involves rejecting an idea as false simply because the argument offered for it is fallacious. See how that's going? You know, that's that's kind of the slippery slope of, of logical fallacies. Having examined... See what I did there with another logical fallacy? Yeah. Having examined the case for a particular viewpoint and found it wanting, it can be tempting to conclude that the point of view is false. This, however, would be to go beyond the evidence. It is possible to offer a fallacious argument for any proposition, including those that are true. One could argue that 2 plus 2 equals 4 on the basis of an appeal to authority. Simon Singh says 2 plus 2 equals 4, so. Or one could argue that taking a paracent... What is that? Paracetamol? Paracetamol. Okay, thank you. Paracetamol. Relieves headaches using a post hoc, quoting, I took the paracetamol and then my headache went away. It worked. Each of these bad arguments has a true conclusion. A proposition, therefore, should not be dismissed because one argument offered in its favor is faulty. Example, people argue that there must be an afterlife because they just can't accept that when we die, that's it. This is an appeal to consequences. Therefore, there is no after there is no life after death, which we cannot prove. So again, this is a logical fallacy, the fallacist fallacy. And I, real quick, I'd like to point out that I contend that all math is uh, a victim of the fallacist fallacy because essentially everybody just happened to tell you beforehand that two plus two equals four. So. I don't trust any of that, and I'm going to start <laughs> teaching otherwise. Oh, teach the controversy, huh? Stop. Teach no, the controversy. Really hurt, stop immediately. I, I have seen the build out and the proofs that make two plus two equal five. <sighs> no, like, yes, but can be done. But no, even no rabbit holes. Even a broken good. clock is right twice a day. <laughs> you know. I hate so. you both. <laughs> I hate you very, very, very much. If there was someone in the group I knew would cling to the math and the sciences. It, I knew where it would be. Yeah, it it might be Mike. Just maybe. I'm not I'm not saying that I condone the violence and the murder because I don't. <laughs> no. On a completely unrelated note. Heavens I no. Have a very nice alligator pond right behind my apartment building. Fred. I better be a big ass gator. You know there's doesn't need to be big. I don't think that this is a, this may be a fallacious argument, but I would say uh, never get into an argument with a pig farmer. <laughs> True story. <laughs> that's, just, that's, a, that's a good point. You know, that's just a word point. to the wise, maybe. So, let's see here. All right. Hi, really radio listeners. This is your host, Andy Cowan, calling my voicemail to make sure that it still works. Please consider calling us, 470 222 Six seven five nine. Bye. Science, bitches. Woohoo! So there's a whole, just a, a bevy of scientific bounty for us. Um. Apparently, we've been doing some science perhaps wrong, for an awfully long time. I know. Big shock, right? Yes. Big shock, because that never happens. No, never. Never, never, never. never. We're never okay. wrong. Well. In this particular case, one of our favorite um, favorite test subjects, and that would be the the rather humble lab rat. Um, they are um, they may be suffering the entire time that they're being tested through no real fault of of even ours, but a typical laboratory environment is kept degrees. is kept between 20, 20 to twenty six degrees centigrade. And mice, you know, if they had it their way, their natural proclivity would be to be in like a 30 degree Celsius range. Pretty warm. Pretty warm. Which is why they like to be around wires and things like that. You know, when they, when they chew them. You know, they're always down in the basement near the furnaces and things like that. They're trying to stay warm. 
because that's what their body's like. 30, incidentally, for those of us who don't speak metric, is 86 degrees Fahrenheit. It's pretty so warm. it's a warm summer day. Yeah, it's pretty warm. Nice day in Florida, so that's why they're all over. But, but in uh, more northern climates, that that can be difficult to to achieve. So, yeah. and I don't know if uh, if any of you guys have been in a lab, but whoever's got their finger on the thermostat in there, laboratory standard is cold. For, that, that you do for all the that you put in for all the math is twenty degrees Celsius or centigrade. Um, no, it is Celsius. Yes. Both I, th- I think both. That's right. They're both. It's the same. It's yeah. 20 degrees centigrade or um, 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty chilly. It's cold. Yeah. Of course, they're all wearing lab coats, so uh, they don't really notice as much. Yeah. So, perhaps all of the studies that we've been doing with mice have been skewed slightly because the little critters are cold and they're automatically working harder to keep themselves at their right temperature, because that's what mammals do. Yeah. So they, they eat perhaps more. They burn more calories to stay warm. Perhaps we're just doing it wrong. There now, was... Um, I, I, go ahead. I think this... I think this... I mean, in some cases, yes, I think this temperature bias matters, but I think in other cases it doesn't. I mean, behaviorally, yes, they may be working harder and eating more, but when we do some of the behavioral tests or when you're just, you know, tracking a growth pattern of a tumor or something like that, I don't really think that's going to be terribly affected. Maybe the rate at which they work, but the, but just what the result is, do they do X or Y, the, you know, things like that, I don't think are going to be affected terribly much. Well, it changes their metabolism. So, you know, the, basically the, the entire way that they live and, and digest things, and all of that is changed you know and and it also i've been in a a colder environment for a long period of time it kind of gets a little stressful you know if um, if you're not uh if you're not well equipped uh one of the things that was good Mm -hmm. hey entertainment um going to top gear of all places (laughs) okay um they did a polar special yeah and they they went and consulted uh, a number of experts. Uh, one, you need to take a lot more food and eat more often when you're in a cold environment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Color is you burn more calories. Two, and this was the thing that was actually most surprising, was when, when talking to a polar explorer, you need to be ready to deal with the hatred. The hatred? Because... Yes, because you will start hating everyone around you. Cold makes you cranky. Yes. Cranky and cold. Yeah. You will get in. It, it, it's not anger. He go, So we'll get angry and irritable. No, it's not anger. It's hatred. See, <laughs> this is why I think that the Canadians are so nice. Because it's the, it's the people that can stay nice in that cold weather that survive because the other ones are kicked out into the cold. <laughs> no, they're not kicked out. They just... They get well, lost in the snow. And are never seen again. They're just, <laughs> they're just politely asked not to come back, eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, could you, could you maybe go outside? Forever. <laughs> maybe go outside and uh, you know go talk to that local moose. <laughs> we got, yeah, we got a real moose problem. Oh yeah. That moose screwed you up, man. <laughs> so Dude, what happened? Man, that, that really, this um, to talk to the moose. <laughs> this this whole study just uh it goes to show that, you know, we may need to take into account the actual environmental variables on the creatures that we're testing things on to get more accurate results. And, yeah, unfortunately, the with the razor-thin margins that science is running on, it's going to cost a little more to do that because then we're going to have to build better cage environments, you know, better better housing for the lab animals. But, really, we should probably do that anyway. Yeah, looking at the yeah. actual uh, article, it says that their immune systems were slightly compromised uh, and made stress on their ability to fight tumors. Also, it had issues with uh, obesity research and neurobiology research because of the lower temperatures. Yeah. And bad results at this level end up being bad results at our level. So 
if we want better science, then we ought to take care of the little things, like the right temperature for the animals. I think that'd be a good thing. Uh, there was there was another uh, tangential story that I heard, um, uh, which is actually where I, I heard this story from, which was from uh, This Week in Science, another podcast that I, I highly recommend to anybody that has another hour. Um, <clears throat> they were talking about uh, about some mice that were going through surgery, and the the mice had a, a huge rate of, of death following the surgery. And one of the um, one of the lab maintenance people noticed that the mice were not getting off the bottom of the cage to go up a couple levels to where their food was because they just felt too fatigued from the surgery and couldn't move. So he just took the simple step of moving the food from that upper level down to where they were. And that changed the survival rate to 100%. From like an 85% mortality to a 100% survival rate. Yeah, and I love scientists. They're my people. Yeah. But we're still people, and we're occasionally idiots, and we do not think of the little things. Yeah. So just, just that little thing went a long way. Going back to being a supervillain, run every plan and every test by a five-year-old. <laughs> yeah. That's... If, if the five-year-old can point out the, the flaws in your plan, you need a new plan. Yeah, no, you explain the no, plan no, the five-year-old. You follow what the five-year-old tells you, and fix it. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Explain, explain to the five-year-old he doesn't understand it. Explain it so he can understand it or change the plan. Yeah, uh, here's a fun thing. Uh, load, an, load an old um, aspirin container or something, you know, a child-proof container. Load it up with M&Ms or something and give it to them and see if they can open it. 35 seconds. I bet they bet can. You, no, I bet you they'll find it. Bet they'll they can. <laughs> so... 35 seconds. Little things. Little things like that. Okay, so another uh, another study moving right along. Uh, two separate pu- papers published this week, one in Nature and one in Nature Cell Biology, have reported culturing human embryos for nearly two weeks. Going well beyond previous efforts, there's no reason to believe that embryos couldn't have survived beyond the two-week mark. But the experiment had to be halted to adhere to the internationally agreed 14-day limit on human embryo research. I found this article out in Gizmodo, and basically they're they're thinking that, yay, artificial wombs are one step closer to reality, which, of course, they are. But then there's that pesky thing of that 14-day, no, we're not messing with human human life in a Petri dish past two weeks. What do you guys think? I can't wait to hear the screams about this. They removed that 14-day from the uh, people who scream about abortions. (laughs) <laughs> Even though this would completely fix the abortion problem, because then, well, you can just, if the mother doesn't want to carry it, you just take it out and put it in an artificial womb. I, I think, from a scientific and other standpoint, I agree with that. That's kind of where I come from. I've had conversations with a lot of women, and some of them would still say, hell no, it's still mine, and if I want it done, I want it gone. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I, I fully the, the, agree. The, also, the point, the point is, is that this... The existence of this technology eliminates that moralistic argument from the pro-life camp. True. Also, I would also look at it in the way of women who, say, could not actually carry a child to term naturally without endangering their own lives. Here, here's the solution. Yeah, that's the big thing. Where, devil's advocate question, maybe, um, discussing how it eliminates the moral question in abortion, where does where do they switch their argument to now that the option exists for you to have that embryo removed and it get to viability and be a human being that the women that are still choosing to have the abortions are just committing a form of murder to selfishly keep that you know what i'm saying like there there's an argument there they're going to find an argument of course there's an argument there they're never going to stop yeah. being assholes but this is still <clears throat> gives them less firepower Oh, I, I agree completely. But I mean, if if when we discuss things like this, especially, you know, it's a good we a good practice to look oh, for yeah. the argument because you know we know it's yeah. going to be there. And in a year, a two years time, what's going to happen is this story is going to be awesome. We're doing human embryos, and the next week we're going to be having that same conversation that we you know we just brought up as a devil's advocate question today. Well, I'm, well we've, I, I we've wonder. We've covered this question before because this is not our first story on artificial on artificial wombs. Oh no, not at all. No, but what we're what we're getting to is it's actually 
closer to a reality, and they have a limit of 13 days. Well, I mean, uh, 14 days. So 14 days is the agreed upon international limit on testing of, right. of embryos. Right. And I know that in the story, they talk about discussing lengthening, like what would they even use? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they talk about 12 weeks, which is, I guess, in uh, European abortion laws or um, up to viability, which is what, weeks. you know, U.S. abortion law uses. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, the eventually you have to take the step as researchers to start doing this because the things that it solves are so many you know the the people that can't have children the you know there's something wrong that they can't carry but they want children of their own you know and it, it's just, there's so many benefits that it, it's a question that they need to start answering more than just offhandedly you know well what are we going to use if it's not 14 days well i wonder if they'd come down to the point of you know, being concerned with uh, the price. Yeah. Okay. It it is a technology that is available to prevent abortions. Now, who's going to pay for it? Because if there's one thing that a um, a fundamental conservative would have to uh, have to complain about is how much something costs. Mm-hmm. And you know that they don't want to provide any prenatal care as it is. No. They certainly don't want to want to provide any you know post-term care oh hell no so there's being pro-life and then there's being pro-birth so okay so we've created a way that you can birth as many babies as you want in fact we can just go ahead and load up test tubes full of them and you can make just babies all the time are you going to pay for it but who's going to pay for it yeah Personally, I think that's where the moralistic argument should go. It's like, all right, fundies, you believe that human life is sacred and all that, so you're not going to let these people have abortions. You're going to you're gonna make it law that they transplant their child into these artificial wombs. Well, they have given up that child. They can sign mm-hmm. it away on the dotted line. You fundies now need to pay for that child. Exactly. Mm-hmm. See, I, I think actually you're going to get intercepted here before we even get to the, the, the artificial womb thing, because most fundamentalists will look at this as um, man playing God. Yeah, um, no, you know what? That the, the, ship sailed when we started doing organ transplants. It's true. <laughs> it's not going to, yeah. that is not going to hold water for any length of time. But, it but it will still, you're, God since modern medicine was a thing. Y'all are, thing, Y'all are both correct. Y'all are both correct. That but argument's going to come up, and I acknowledge that that absolutely and it'll be shut will down. be an argument. I'm just yeah. saying it's not going to last very long. Yeah, it'll come up, and then it'll be shut down. Yeah, so real fast. But it's one. This is one of those things that yeah, we're going to keep talking about it because a, it's really awesome technology, and it leads to all sorts of things. And being being futurists and forward thinking people, progressive people. This is a thing that we're we're going to have to deal with one way or another. So we're gonna we're gonna oh. slowly nibble away at the argument, and maybe maybe we'll stumble upon something. There's also actually what doing worse with this idea is the okay they make it so that instead of getting abortion, you go into the artificial womb. Okay, what happens to the children after they're born? Yeah, are we going who's, to have a whose responsibility uh, are these yeah, children? Beyond, beyond whose responsibility is it going to be more along the lines of we're going to have a situation like the movie Soldier? Okay, good. You've got all these children that are being born. Okay, no one's going to take care of them. The government does and trains them as expendable soldiers. Yeah, I don't think we exactly want that. You know, they actually, um, in the, the comments on the, the page, they, they actually, uh, kind of an interesting question that somebody posed. Um, I wonder if society would actually accept a single man paying for a donor egg to combine with his sperm for implantation into an artificial embryo. Being a single father, widowed or divorced, carries enough of a stigma, it seems. I wonder how people Hmm. at large would react to a single man wanting to have a child without a mother ever being in the picture. I mean, when you look at things like this... When women can do it. Yeah, I mean, we look at things like this, and and usually the the thought we have, and and obviously rightly so, because right now having a baby is 100% with a woman, you know, the the thought is immediately to women, and and what do women want, and how would it affect abortions, and, and things like that. But, I mean, that's an incredibly insightful question you know for men out there that are single or hey i don't i don't have prospects or gay men or or something of that ilk that want children you know yeah how would that be reacted to 
by these same people that are losing their minds Ooh. over the other moral questions we've raised. So many, so many things in that. Oh, I love it. This is an entire episode in, the in, whole, in yeah, one The thing. whole landscape of mm -hmm. human morality is going to change as this advances, because now we've now we've got artificial wombs, and you know we're also doing genetic engineering all the time. What hap What happens when we get to the point where we can take genetic material from two people that are a same-sex couple and make a child out of it? Or just at that point, you can also have somebody clone themselves. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what happens then? You know, just straight up cloning, <laughs> and you know, yeah. What does happen then? Because also... Because then the... we get to brain transplant, and I just keep cloning my body, so I stay young forever. <clears throat> well, your body would stay young, but your brain wouldn't. Yeah. So that's that's still the problem. Age. Yeah, that's you'd have to... Have the entire art thing with... Uh, yeah. Discussion with Michio Kaku about um, being able to upload your consciousness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, this all reminds me of, of a, a book series that I've been reading that I, I must get back and I'm going to reread it again, which is like uh, 120 hours or so um, of, of Audible. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to then turn it into a, into a game setting because I, I think I need to live in that world a little more and to what truly series? investigate I I, all of these questions. The one, this is the one with the... With the um... This is Peter F. Hamilton's uh, Commonwealth Universe. Yeah, it's the one that opens up with the, the surprise Dyson Sphere yes. and the trains that go through portals and all that yes. stuff. Yes, yes. It's a very cool, yeah, very I, cool thing. I, I've I, read the original, the original three not-quite-books thing. Well, there was two books. Well, there's the Neutronium Alchemist... Um, oh, no, those are, are, those are in a different... The Neutronium Alchemist and the other one. Those are in, in a different universe. That's, oh. that's not even what I'm talking about. No, uh, we're talking about um, Pandora's Star and uh, then Judas Unchained. That's the first two in this series. And then it goes into the Void Trilogy. And then there's another book that he just finished writing. And yeah, and then he's, there's two more. So he's, uh, he's almost completed the series. It, it, it'll be out in print later this year. So, yes. But it, it expands like thousands of years. <laughs> because again with rejuvenation technologies and cloned bodies and things like that you die when you want to in this universe so it's it's just a fascinating look at the way you then have to deal with people that are absurdly old when some people might just be in their first life so yeah. it's um it's just a fascinating look at things and it it raises so many questions that you just don't have in our normal day-to-day -day experience. So I'm going to go through it and, and really uh, dig into it. I think it would be a, a rich environment to, to just mine for data. Um, and we won't know I until we until we're in it. Oh, yeah. Highly recommend it. Okay. So let's move on to something a little closer to home, but still in the future. Elon Musk. I got two stories about Elon Musk, uh, about his two major enterprises, SpaceX he managed to do it again. He landed another rocket just last night on the barge at, at night, speed. at night, and at a higher speed. So just SpaceX is doing victory oh, laps. Yes. Needed more yeah. engines, but took care of it. Yeah. Well, that's fine. <laughs> if you've got the fuel, he can do it slower or he can do it fast. You know, one way or the other, you still have to, you know, cut the momentum. But... He's got the technology, and he's definitely zeroing in on exactly what he has to do with that. So if the difference uh, it was for this one was who's putting the satellite was going into higher orbit, so he needed more thrust at the, at the first stage. It's just so cool. All the things that he's doing, so, so cool. Yeah, and and the fact that it was at night. I mean, uh, let's see here. I've I've got the video. Let's see. Uh, how long is this thing? Oh, an hour long enough oh geez that's an hour screw that um <laughs> follow the link follow the link in the show notes people uh well, but one or really radio not sponsored by spacex that's right not yet sponsored well, if you want by to spacex, SpaceX if you want to elon musk <laughs> if you're out there we're looking bring it, for on, bring it on bring it on yeah I'd, I'd be i'd be happy to happy to fly your banner that'd be, be fantastic Absolutely. now speaking of other banners to fly tesla's model x has a really really good air filtration system in fact it's a it has a bio de, bio weapon defense mode. Huh. That's forward thinking right there. Yeah. 
Is that standard or is that add on? Is that <laughs> standard? I think it might be standard. That's, that's the best so in good. the Model X. Um, because only Tony Stark would go. You know what my car needs, and I'm going to give it to the public bioweapon defense capability. Yeah, Elon Musk tweeted out bioweapon defense mode is real. This is what happens when you turn it on. <laughs> wow. Holy crap. Jesus. This, this freaking guy. <laughs> this guy. He yeah. People, to dark. people think about, okay, let's, make, let's make carpet standard. Let's make these other features standard. Let's make everything, everything else. He's like, nope, screw it. Let's make bioweapon defense standard. I want to bring the, everybody from, you know, weaponized plague. The filtration system apparently held up to lab, te lab testing and even, according to Tesla, started cleaning the air outside of the car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When the car goes, dude, your air is freaking dirty. Let me clean that for you. The car is going to have a carbon negative all footprint. The funding ever. We need, okay. we need everybody to drive this. Uh, suddenly, the, everything's great. Just replace every single car in Beijing with one of these. It'll be done in a week. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's great because they're not putting any emissions out and they're cleaning the air. They're actually carbon negative. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, awesome. So... <laughs> All the fleet vehicles in LA are being changed over to Teslas. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. I don't know. Um, quoting from from this uh, from Tesla, the air filtration system was put to the test in real world environments, from California freeways during rush hour to smelly marshes, landfills, and cow pastures in the Central Valley of California to major cities in China. We wanted to ensure that it captured fine particulate matter and gaseous pollutants, as well as bacteria, viruses, pollen, and mold spores. When we decided to take things a step further and test the complete system as we would on the road, but in an environment where we could precisely control and carefully monitor atmospheric conditions. A Model X was placed in a large bubble containment with extreme levels of pollution. 1,000 um, micro... Parts per million. Yeah, parts per million, yeah. Uh, well, PPM 2.5. Uh, versus the EPA's good air quality index limit of, uh, of 12. 12. So 1,000 versus 12. So, yeah, order of magnitude. Yeah, easily. Um... When we closed the Falcon doors and activated bioweapon defense mode. I I don't care. I want a car that has a bioweapon defense mode. I mean, I never used it. I just want the damn yeah. thing. Just, just to say you have it. Yeah. It just, that's, that's a point of pride. Standard. Why, why are you getting a Tesla? I've got asthma. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you activating bioweapon defense mode? You mean your air, air filtration system? No, dick. I mean bioweapon defense mode. It's yeah. on the button. Yeah, it's on the button, dude. <laughs> Don't question me. Yeah. Is that going to be the red button or the green button? It's I... going to be the yes button because I'm yeah, not on all the time. Exactly, yeah. Although it's billed as a bioweapon defense system, bioweapon attacks are astoundingly rare unless the occupant plans to drive their Tesla through parts of ISIS-held Iraq and Syria. They're not likely to ever encounter such attacks. And even then, a myriad of other hazards would probably make the quality of the filter mostly irrelevant. Until we so, build a car that to, is fine with those buy, hazards, too. I need to buy a specialized Model X that's up-armored. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. You're not going to... It's going to really decrease your range. <laughs> Just to let you know, it's going to really decrease your it's, range. That's fine. It's but, for yeah. base defense. Yeah. So, bioweapon defense mode in Tesla Model X. That's Ooh. just... Yeah. I don't think marketing gets much cooler than that, really. Defense. It's like, wait, I have to, I have to write an article on the bioweapon defense mode of the car. Please <laughs> sign me up. The fact that the thing can seat seven. Really? No. They have three different interior layouts: a seven seat, a six seat, and a five seat. Depends the... on how much cargo space you want. That's it. Well, because the seven and the six basically remove the cargo space. Is that in the Model X? Yep, I'm staring at oh, the okay, okay. right now. So the, the Model X is the one with the Falcon doors. That's the new one, not the model. Yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's the that's so, the newer one that just came out. Okay. For those of you with the, those those 2.5 kids, yeah. you can have the, you can have the, the, the seven-seater with bioweapon defense mode. Well, now yeah, that's much more it. entertaining to me. Um, though I, I will note... Um, so much more fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I will note that uh, Chrysler is finally coming out with a minivan model, uh, the uh, Pacifica, that is hybrid. So it's going to get like 80 miles to the gallon. 
Um, so yeah, and so that's that's the first um, the first in class uh, you know hybrid vehicle that that they're going to be doing, and it's a hybrid, so it will also have the gasoline engine. That's that's something I'm more inclined to have, but it's not going to have you know bioweapon defense mode. So yet yeah, he'll eventually start selling that to other car companies. Yeah, well, yeah, ought to. Hell yeah, he has he has licensed out all of his patents for free. So all the all the patents on the car are basically open. Go ahead, please proliferate this technology. We need more of it out there. So he's well, he's definitely. I, I can say the military will ahead. probably pro- proliferate bioweapon defense mode. Yeah, yeah, I I could definitely see politicians uh, really jumping on the bandwagon. It's like oh, okay, no anthrax for me. Sounds good. Anyway, hey, Mike, your turn. All right, pass it along to me. I'm passing the torch. Okay. So, we all know how much I love space. No clue. Because I <laughs> love space. Don't you lie to me. You know exactly how much I love I space. Think, I think we you're, know. You're um, space core in human form. Yes, we know. So, I have plugged these guys before, and I'm going to plug them again, because there is a new... A uh, celestial event about to happen, and of course, my friends over at at SLU, another another group that I would absolutely love to sponsor us if they're listening. Uh, finger guns. Um, <laughs> they are covering what is being called the transit of Mercury. Um, Mercury, as we all know, is the the closest planet to the sun. It's a little one. It goes really really fast, uh, and it orbits the sun around what is it like 88 days, something like that. I think so, so it goes around real fast, and um, it's, at, its orbit is at, at an angle to ours. So oftentimes we don't notice this. But coming up, we are going to actually be able to see Mercury, the little black dot, crossing the sun. Now, obviously, you really should not go outside and just stare at the sun to watch this, even though, yes, you can see it with the naked eye, or more accurately, with a telescope. Because um, you're looking that. at the sun. Yeah, d- don't do that. That's that's bad. Yeah, um, there are instead, no things you can do. Yeah, instead, what you should do is go to organizations like SLU or any or any number of uh, uh, observatories. I'm sure that are going to be covering the event, and they will you know run it through filters, and so you can watch it live as it is happening, uh, and uh, see another planet cross in front of the sun, which is you know it's it's something that we don't see very often. I think the last time was like a decade ago that it was it, everything lined up for us to watch it. Yeah, it and was, we won't uh, see it, and we won't see it again yeah, for several so years. So 2019 is yeah. 2006. So, yeah, you know, yeah, catch it while it's here. Years. Yeah, the transit of Mercury where we can see it is every three years. Yeah, so catch it while it's here. It's it's cool to watch. Excellent. Because, every every 13 you know, years, yeah. More more space. We need more space. Uh, awesome. Next up. On, onward, uh, it's a little something a little more closer to home. Uh, I'm pretty sure we mentioned this in a previous show. I know yes. we've been talking around around the house. The RSS uh, Bodie McBoatface. Bodie McBoatface is dead. Long live Bodie McBoatface. Uh, the the organization, um, the Natural Environment Research Council, has finally announced what they're gonna name the boat. Uh, they are not calling it the Bodie McBoatface. Sad. They're, it is named instead uh, the R. The RRS, Sir David Attenborough, um, and so which that, is that it's is good. Kind of it's it, a no, good it's, name. It's yeah. a good. It is a good name. It was on the petition. It was one of the ones on the petition. Um, however, however, they they did not name it Bodie McVotes, which made many people sad. Uh, they, they, among the many reasons, this is directly from the article. Among the many reasons the name was not picked, perhaps the most important is that the ship will be operating in dangerous waters. If the worst is to happen, such as its sinking, the name would perhaps be not so amusing to friends and relatives that have lost loved ones. Good point. Case. Good it's a, point. It's a so, good yes, point, the, but I think it'd still David be very memorable. Sir David Attenborough. However, however, the guys at uh, the NERC are not without a sense of humor. Yep. They are not complete bastards. So instead, uh, and Andy has so graciously pulled up the image, uh, they have taken the name, the Bodie McBoatface, and they have given it to the uh, robotic assistant drone that is attached to this particular vessel. And they have called that the Bodie McBoatface. <laughs> I'm entirely okay with the remote operated drone Bodie McBoatface. Yeah. Yes. Yep. There, there has, there have been some. I have seen some, 
some people being humorous about it, some people just being jerks uh, about oh, you. No, no, no. <laughs> That's what you do on the internet. Democracy people on the internet being jerks? All that, um, no, but... I have heard that there's now a petition to rename David Attenborough, but... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, there is. Uh, you know. so, okay. Oh wow! While there are some some real sour grapes in this whole in this whole uh, affair, I really think that uh, everyone has had a good time with this. I yeah. really think it turned out as good as we could possibly expect. I think it's great. Yeah, uh, everyone I... I've talked to thinks it's also hilarious. So good on them for you know humoring us. Yeah, I I desperately the wanted there to be. I just really wanted there to be like a dinghy or something on board that that was the 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 Bodie McBoat face. The Bodie McBoat face. Yeah. So <laughs> so that they've made an undersea vessel there. Sorry, you know. I want a nuclear submarine. That's the Bodie McBoat face. The Bodie McBoat face. <laughs> well, you know, the United States could still do it. <laughs> USA. 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 I severely doubt that they would because I. You there? But anyway, so that is the that is the ultimate fit. Oh, you're cutting Ooh. out, Mike. 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 We're losing you. Mike. You're, this you're, is the NSA. He was about you're, to you're reveal cutting. something about our military. Yeah, you, you were about to say something about uh, about the the Navy, and, and then you cut out. So I think they, they may be <laughs> censoring you. I was going to say that we have, uh, they have no sense of humor. That be no. true. That be true. That is, that is absolutely true. Uh, and now to, to finally tonight, finally tonight, and I hate I hate to end it on a, a low note, but I think oh, it's oh. it's important. Uh, Harold Croteau, a uh, Nobel Prize winning chemist, he died uh, he died he died on Saturday, so it was after the show. Uh, and the reason I specifically picked this one out is because we have talked about his most famous discovery many times before. This is the man who discovered buckyballs. Buckyballs. Buckminster Fullerene. Yes. He he discovered the fullerene configuration of carbon, which is you know a perfectly sphere of a, spherical atom composed of um, 60, hexagons. And, 60 um, carbon atoms. Hex, hexagons and octagons, or something like that. Uh, and, pentagons the and point, hexagons. The point of the discovery is that it is extremely significant to uh, nanotechnology, and there have been thousands of papers written about it since its discovery, and he has finally succumbed to Lou Gehrig's disease. Oh. So, good night, see, good night, sweet prince. We will take... We will take your balls and go home. <laughs> and and I'm the bad person. <clears throat> oh. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> and what perfect timing. That's going to wrap it up for part one of our two-part normal show here. This is uh, part A, and we will go to part B here momentarily. And then there'll be a 10-minute intermission for those that are listening in the, uh, in the live stream. And then we'll be back after we do the necessary human things with more news, uh, some good, some bad, some from the, um, uh, from the court system. And then we'll, uh, well, we'll see you all back here in about 10 minutes or so. <laughs>